Turn in your Bibles or your phone, tablet, whatever you have, to Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1. We're going to read, it's, it's kind of a longer passage, so just stay with me as we, as we read through it. There's important stuff in every verse, so don't, don't fall asleep on me. Don't, don't get bored with the, the, there's a lot of names, there's a lot of geography. Don't fade on me this morning. Again, by way of introduction, last fall we studied the book of Joshua. Joshua had taken up the mantle of Moses and led the people years of conquest um, in the land of Canaan to get the land that was promised centuries early to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now as we go to the book of Judges, Joshua has passed away. This great faithful leader has passed away. And now we pick up the story of, of what happened after that. So Judges chapter 1, I'm going to read the first chapter and then the first five verses kind of formed the conclusion to chapter 1. So we'll read through verse 5 of chapter 2. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek at Bezek and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword, and they set the city on fire. And afterward, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites, who lived in the hill country, in the Negev, in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba, and they defeated Sheshai and Ahiman and Talmai. From there they went against the inhabitants of Debur, and the name of Debur was formerly Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. And when she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing. Since you have set me in the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. And the descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad. And they went and settled with the people. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath and devoted it to destruction. So the name of the city was called Hormah. Judah also captured Gaza with its territory and Ashkelon with its territory and Ekron with its territory. And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, he drove out from it the three sons of Anak. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. The house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph scouted out Bethel. Now the name of the city was formerly Luz. And the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Please show us the way into the city, and we will deal kindly with you. And he showed them the way into the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword. But they let the man and all his family go. And the man went to the land of the Hittites and built a city and called its name Luz. And that is its name to this day. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shion and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages or the inhabitants of Iblim and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. But the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. When Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in 
Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them, and Zebulon did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalah. So the Canaanites lived among them, but became subject to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or of Allah or of Aksib or Helba or Aphek or of Rehob. And so the Asherites lived among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anah. So they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became subject to forced labor for them. The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. The Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Perez, in Ajalon, and in Shaldim. But the hand of the house of Joseph rested heavily on them, and they became subject to forced labor. And the border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim, from Selah, and upward. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bakram, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bacham, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that we would sit under its authority and it would shape how we think and how we live this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Sometimes your first impression of, of a person or of a situation or of a thing is not accurate, right? Sometimes things are not often as they initially seem. We, we have that cliche, don't judge a book by its cover, right? And so, for example, maybe you've, you've bought a house or a car or a boat or something like that, and initially it looks great, you bought it used, it looks good, everything's fine, and then as you get to acquainted with the house, the car, the boat, whatever it is, you realize that there are problems. It's not as good as it looks. Maybe with some of you with, with school starting back up, your first impression of someone maybe isn't accurate. Maybe you meet someone on a bad day and they seem kind of upset or angry, but as you get to know them in the weeks and months ahead, maybe they become a friend or vice versa. Someone who seems really kind initially maybe isn't that kind as you get to know them. I can give you a very simple example of, of this situation. Um, last summer, I was in New York for a, a soccer coaching course, and my, some of you have heard some of this story before, my sports watch broke. And so when I got back down to South Carolina, I did what every person does. You go on Amazon, you find a new watch, and I ordered it, and it came a week later. I got the watch. It looked great. Loved the watch. It was, looked great, and it worked great for about three weeks. And then about three weeks after I got it one night, it started to beep. And it didn't stop beeping. And so by the time I went to bed, I had to put the watch in the car because it just would not stop beeping. The next morning, I had the watch. It was still beeping. Um, it looked great, but it, it wasn't functioning. It just kept beeping. So I put the, the watch in a little box, and I went over to uh, the pack mail store on Coleman and went and saw Bill. I said, Bill, I need to send this back to, to the, the watch company in California. And I thought Bill might think I was like shipping a bomb or something because there's a little box that's beeping. Um, but Bill, Bill sent it out, and the watch looked great, and it worked great for about three weeks. It was not functioning, though. It had the appearance of a watch that was working, but it didn't work. And that's a very simple example of what I'm talking about here. That's really the perspective that we have as we begin Judges chapter 1. There's the appearance that things are going well for the people of Israel, the tribes of Judah, but they are not functioning right. They are not living correctly. And that begins to lead to consequences down the line. It appears on the surface in the first few verses that they're conquering cities, they're doing well. It's the appearance of success, but really, as we'll see this morning, they're really being disobedient. And that leads to destruction in the lives of the people of Israel. 
as we get to verse 1, I don't know if you noticed, but verse 1 of Judges begins the exact same way the book of Joshua does. The book of Joshua said, after the death of Moses. Here in Judges it says, after the death of Joshua. And so here we're, we're detailing the initial success of the people as they invaded Canaan. And you remember Joshua was a faithful leader. He led the people into the land and he was faithful to the Lord. We talked about that last fall. Here, the book of Judges does begin with a, a note of optimism, a hint of optimism. It, it says in the first few verses that the people went and sought the direction of the Lord. They said, who will go and fight the Canaanites? They asked the Lord, guide us. And so the Lord answers his people. He gives his people guidance. He gives them assurance that he's with them and will provide for them. And so the Lord says, Judah will go up first, and I've given all the land to them. And so the opening verses have this, this hint of optimism that things are going to work out well for God's people. But as we'll see this morning, it's the appearance of biblical faith without the commitment to the Lord that's necessary to follow him. There isn't a depth of commitment, a depth of faith that God requires of his people. And, and so there's apparent success, there's surface level success for God's people, but there's an increasing pattern of disobedience that we see in Judges chapter 1. And what seems to be devoted faith really becomes just a formal religion. They're just kind of going through the motions in Israel. Their heart is not into it. And I think what we'll see is that the commitment God shares to his people, he's committed to them, but his people are not committed to him. God's committed to his people, but his people are not committed to him. And so there's really, we read through a lot, there's really three sections that we're going to cover from, from chapter 1. Verses 3 through 21 describe the work of the tribe of Judah. Judah is the most important tribe. The, the ruler will come out of Judah. So verses 3 through 21 describe the work of the tribe of Judah. More than half the chapter is devoted to this tribe. And then verses 22 through the end of the chapter describe the other tribes that are to the north of Judah. Judah's in the south. The other tribes are in the north. And then verses 1 through 5 of chapter 2 describe the Lord's response to his people. How God responds. And so, as we look at these, these narratives, in the midst of all the stuff that we read in chapter 1, there's also three little short narratives that are kind of tucked in there. There's a little narrative about this man named Adonai Bezek. Then there's a narrative about Othniel and his wife, and Caleb, her father. And then there's a third narrative of these spies that enter Bethel. And so, in the midst of all this, we will highlight these three little narratives that are tucked into chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2. So first, let's look at verses 3 through 21. The work of Judah, the tribe of Judah in the south. Over half the chapter is devoted to this tribe. And, and so they're going into the land of Canaan. And as we think of the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan is a bunch of various different people groups. Various different city-states. It's not just one people group that they're fighting against. It's various different city-states that they're fighting against. And when we think of Israel, we don't think of a unified nation. This isn't... America going to war. This isn't a country going to war. This is 12 tribes that are unified by a religion. 12 tribes unified by a religion. In fact, the word nation is only used one time in the book of Judges for the people of Israel. So the writer does not see them as a unified nation. He uses that word, the Hebrew word is goy. He uses that one time in all of the book of Judges. And they don't act unified, as we'll see here in chapter 1. As we look at verses 3 through 21, remember what they were commanded to do. The people of Israel, all the tribes were commanded to take the land God had promised them and remove, destroy, kill the people of Canaan. That was what they were commanded to do. For years, and when I say years, really centuries, the, the people living in Canaan had been living wicked lives. And so when the Lord says remove them, take them from the land, it's punishment for centuries of wickedness. If you want to read about what they were doing, read Leviticus 18, read Deuteronomy 9, and you can read about the widespread immorality, the widespread child sacrifice that was going on as part of their religion in Canaan. It's really horrible. And so the Lord is saying, now their time has come. Their punishment has come, and I'm going to use my people to punish them. And so the people of Canaan, we shouldn't think of them as being innocent. They were not innocent people. These are wicked, immoral people that... God has every right to punish because he's the creator. He decides how we're supposed to live. 
And so God is executing justice in Canaan. And more than that, he's also upholding his promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob that he would give this land to his people. So he's being just and he's being faithful as we begin chapter 1. And the tribes here are called to be obedient. They're called to destroy the people of Canaan and take the land. So in verse 4 it says, They defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites at Bezek. And they took this man, Adonai Bezek. And Adonai means basically this idea of lord or mayor or governor. So governor Bezek or mayor Bezek. They took him as captive. And then they punished him. They chopped off his, his thumbs and his toes and... This is the, the first little narrative of three narratives that are tucked into our chapter this morning. So they, they chopped off his fingers, they chopped off his toes, and as we read that this morning, it does seem rather gruesome that they would do that, and, and I think we might even ask the question, was that really necessary? Did they need to torture this man? But as one, one writer on this passage said, while 21st centuries like us might have qualms about how he was treated, the king doesn't have qualms. He knows he's getting justice. The king doesn't complain here. If you read the, the passage, he understands because he has done this to everyone else. He's getting it returned to him. The eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. He is getting justice returned to him. And so while we might be a little apprehensive about it, the king understood what was happening to him. He was being treated justly. But what's more interesting than that, than torturing this king is the fact that this is the first minor incident where the people of Israel, the people of Judah rather, do not obey the Lord. Because what did the Lord tell them? Did the Lord tell them, hey, chop off his thumbs? No, the Lord said, kill him. He, he deserves to die. He's been a wicked ruler to kill him. And they don't. They torture him a little bit, make him pay a little bit, and then they haul him back. And so they're being disobedient. They're not following what God had commanded in Deuteronomy 7. Before Moses had died, Moses said, leave no survivors. This land needs to be cleansed. This land needs to be given over to God's people. And they disobeyed. And so the, the verses from here through verse 20 show the people of Judah in the three major geographic areas of Canaan. First, they're in the hill country. Then second, they're south in the Negev, which is basically the desert, the dry land south of southern Judah. And then thirdly, uh, the Hebrew word Shephelah, which is basically the lowlands near the, the, um, the coastal plain. So kind of if you're looking, it'd be on the western side going up the coast. And then it says they conquered a, a city called Hebron. And this is important before we move on for one reason. This will be the capital for King David when he takes over um, the people of Israel. This will be his initial capital for seven years. This is an important city that they take. And so Hebron is an important city about 19 miles south of Jerusalem. And it's also, if you remember back to the book of Genesis, this is where Abraham bought some property to bury his relatives. So this is really kind of sacred ground for the people of Israel. And then they conquer, they go on and conquer a town called Debur, which is 11 miles south. So we're still moving south, the people of Judah. And this city, Debur, is really a city that probably had a library or had some sort of learning because the initial name of the city is city of books or city of letters. And so it was a place of learning, maybe a library, uh, but they, they conquer that city and they conquer it really in the text matter of factly. It just says they conquered this city. But here we get the second of three personal narratives. Here's the narrative of Caleb. And Caleb, who was a you know, friend of Joshua for so many years, says, whoever leads the attack will win my daughter. So he offers his pride. He'll win my daughter if we can fight and win this land. And so this man, Othniel, is mentioned for the first time. He's not a native Israelite. He's actually from the clan of Edom, which was a, uh, an adversary of Israel. He's not an Israelite. He's not even from Judah. And he's a relative. He's either a nephew, a younger brother. He's somehow related. But he takes him up on the offer and boldly leads, courageously leads this charge on the city. And in this, this second of three little short narratives, Othniel shows bravery. His new wife shows wisdom. She realizes that the land they've been given is basically desert land and realizes we're not going to be able to drink any water here. And so she says, we need some water. And she requests that her dad give some land with, with springs for water. And, and Caleb responds and says, I'm going to give you multiple springs of water. And so this is the second 
short narrative. And before we move on, it might be interesting to ask, why does the author include this little narrative? Why is this narrative in chapter 1? There could be a few reasons. One, it does remind us of Caleb, who was faithful like Joshua. He was a friend of Joshua, and it reminds us to be faithful. Because as we see here, the people are not faithful to the Lord. It also foreshadows Othniel, who will show up in a later chapter as one of the judges, one of the, the leaders in Israel. And he's not even an Israelite. The people of Israel are, they can't even lead themselves. They bring someone who's from Edom to lead them. It's also possible, I think this is an interesting reason, this is one of the few little short stories in the book of Judges where all three characters, every character in the story, is shown in a positive light. We see bravery, we see wisdom, and then from Caleb we see generosity. He is generous with what he has to provide for his, his family. And so it, it's an example for people to follow. And so this, this second narrative shows people who are following the Lord. And, and that's in contrast with the first little narrative that that guy, Adonai Bezek. Remember, he was treated wrongly. He should have just been killed. They shouldn't have tortured him. They should have just killed him. People of Judah disobeyed. Here in this second narrative, we see a pattern of obedience, people following the Lord. And so it's quite a contrast to that first narrative. The report of Judah concludes in, in verses 16 through 19. It concludes, it ends, they were successful, but only to a point. Only to a point. It says they took the, the high country, but not the plains, the level area. They, they didn't take that area because the, the Canaanites had iron chariots. And what the, what the writer is basically, I think, insinuating or telling us is, that the people of Judah were afraid to continue to fight because they saw the iron chariots and realized they didn't have them. And instead of trusting that the Lord would provide the land, they said, well, we've got the highlands. We're good. We've got some mountain property. Uh, we're good. Got a good view in the hill country. We don't need the plains. And that was disobedient. They were not following the Lord. They didn't trust him. And so here again, it appears that they're successful. They've taken a lot of land. They've taken a bunch of the, the hill country. But they've not done what God had asked them to do. They didn't conquer everyone in their area. In fact, verse 21 says that the tribe of Benjamin couldn't even conquer Jerusalem. Jerusalem, one of the oldest cities in the world, a city that's been inhabited for consecutively for over 5,000 years, the tribe of Benjamin couldn't take them. And so Jerusalem remains in the hands of the Jebusites until King David shows up hundreds of years later and conquers them and finally makes out a capital. So that's, that's a picture of the, the opening versus the southern tribe of, of Judah. And then 22, verses 22 through 36. If we're looking at the map of Canaan, we're going to now look north to the remaining tribes. And so the, the writer here is beginning to look north. If he had a map in the back of his Bible, he's scanning north um, to look at the remaining tribes. And so he describes the house of Joseph, the two tribes that came from Joseph. And here we see a, the third short narrative. So we've had one story of justice, one of romance. Here we have a story of really of spy work, of espionage. Um, this is what we see. Several spies go ahead to this, this town of Bethel. And they find a local who lives in Bethel, and they say, show us the way into your city. Show us the way. Which, if we step back and look at it, it, it it's kind of an absurd question. Because the city gates would have been obvious. It wasn't hard to find the city gates. That's where everyone's going in and out of. So something more is happening here in the text. One, they're either trying to find a secret entrance into the city, which is possible, or I, I think it's probably more likely to say they're trying to go into the city with some locals and just kind of blend in. They're trying to just walk in with some locals and look like they belong there. And so this is kind of espionage. This is, you know, we might think of James Bond trying to get behind enemy lines, or Jason Bourne trying to deceive people to get behind into hostile territory. This is what they're doing. They're trying to blend in to get into the city to find a weakness. That's what they're doing. It also, especially if you were here last fall, it should remind you of Joshua chapter 2, the story of Rahab and the two spies that Joshua sent out. If you remember in that story, just like in this story, both times, a surveillance team, a team of spies, was sent ahead to scout out the land. And, and in Joshua 2 and here in Judges 1, they, they find a citizen that will help them. And they request help. And, and in both situations, with Rahab and here, 
they promise a reward for their help. Very similar situations. But there is a notable difference, and I think this is why it's in our text. This is what we're supposed to learn from it. A big difference between what happened with Rahab and what happens here. Rahab declared her faith in the God of Israel. And she joined the people of Israel. She renounced her old religion, her old people, and joined the people of Israel. Joined the people of God. Here, what happens? We don't even have the guy's name. He doesn't join the people of Israel. He doesn't devote his faith to Yahweh, the God of Israel. He says, great, I helped you out. I'm out. And he goes and starts another city with pagan worship. And these spies let him do that. So once again, the the tribes here, the northern tribes, are compromising with this man. He doesn't devote his faith to Yahweh like Rahab. He doesn't join the people of Israel. He leaves and begins his pagan practices somewhere else. And they allow him to do that. And that's clearly disobedient to what God had instructed Moses and what Moses had instructed the people and Joshua had instructed the people. And so they're disobeying the word of the Lord. And that's not minor. Because God requires obedience of his people. He requires obedience from us. And so I hope you're seeing as, as we're going through this chapter, there's a lot of information, but there, there is on the surface level an appearance of success. That they're conquering some lands, they're doing the spies, it all worked out. But underneath that surface level, level of success, there's disobedience. They are disregarding the word of the Lord. There's also cultural compromise. They're, they're trying to negotiate with the people of Canaan. They're, they're compromising with the values and the practices of the people there. And instead of following the Lord, they're really following the practices of the Canaanite culture. So instead of devoting themselves to the Lord, they're compromising. And they're doing that because it's easier. Life is just easier if you do that. There's a lesson here. As we go through the the next few verses, there's a bunch of names and places, and a lot of it's foreign to us. It's foreign to me. And as, as one writer commenting on this passage said, we might be tempted to look at this, he says, as a frustrated cartographer, picking up his pen and just writing out all these all these names of places and, and writing a geography list. But, as I read this week, this is the pen of a preacher. What we're reading is the pen of a preacher. And the preacher in these verses, finishing chapter 1, is pounding home the message that this tribe and this tribe did not drive out the people. They did not obey the Lord. And so seven times the writer accuses the people in this way. And so what we see here is not geographical tedium, but it is theological accusation. They were not following the Lord. And so that's why in the the final verses of chapter 1, it says this tribe didn't drive them out. This tribe did not drive them out. In those verses, four times, the writer says the Canaanites became the subject of forced labor. Four times. Instead of driving those people out, killing them, removing them, they just said, hey, we, we we can get some cheap labor here. We can make some money off these people. And it's easier. But that was not what God told them to do. And so the list here that we read of Manasseh and Zebulon and Asher, these tribes, this is not minutia. This is the preacher, the writer here, kind of pounding his pulpit and saying, these people disobey the Lord. One tribe after another did not follow the Lord. They compromised. And so here's a picture of apparent success, but really clear disobedience. It's pragmatic success, but spiritual failure. Pragmatic success, but spiritual failure. The people of Israel are tolerating Baal, which is one of the local gods, and they're tolerating the other gods, and that reasonable, tolerant attitude in Israel soon becomes apostasy. And we'll see that in the weeks ahead. Because tolerating Baal ultimately leads to bowing to Baal. And for us, the sin that we tolerate really becomes the sin that we bow to. The sin that we tolerate really becomes the sin that we bow to. And that's how chapter 1 finishes. As we conclude, we look at chapter 2, the first five verses. We see God's response. We see how the Lord responds to the actions of his people. Chapter 1 began with the words of the Lord, and it was a word of assurance and guidance. I will be with you. I will guide you. Here we see the word of the Lord to kind of conclude this section, and it's a word of threat, and it's a word of accusation. 
It's a word from the Lord that reveals their disobedience and their sin. Verse 1 of chapter 2 says, The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bacham. When we read that, we think the angel of the Lord, and sometimes we think of angels, we think of a, a nice, feathery, pleasant white figure on a Hallmark card or something. Really, the word there is messenger. It's a messenger of the Lord. This is the same messenger, this is the same person that God promised Moses in Exodus 23 would go before his people into the promised land and really win the battles for them. This is the same person. And so the question is, why is this messenger coming up from Gilgal? Does the messenger of the Lord, does he live in Gilgal? Why is he spending time there? If you remember from last fall, Gilgal is near Jericho. It's west of the Jordan River. Gilgal is where the people, when they came into the Promised Land, this is where they first had their camp. If you remember from last fall, this is where they had those 12 stones to um, be in honor of the Lord, a memorial of 12 stones to honor the Lord's faithfulness. They observed the sacraments, the two sacraments they had, circumcision and Passover. This is an important spot. On top of that, Gilgal is a spot in Joshua 5, where when Joshua, before they go to attack Jericho, Joshua was planning the, the attack, and he almost bumps into this person, the commander of the Lord's army. And it's really the Lord that he bumps into. That was near Gilgal. And so the, the location is important for us this morning. Because what, what the writer is saying, and, and really what God is saying, is this. To the people of Judah, do you remember what happened at Gilgal? Do you remember my faithfulness to you? I brought you into this land. Do you remember the, the record of Joshua meeting me? And I promised I would go before him and lead you into this land. Do you remember Gilgal? The Lord says, you don't remember it. And in fact, here in verses 3, 4, and 5, he says, you've broken the covenant. You've broken your covenant with me. You've disobeyed me. And because of that, I'm not going to drive these people out. Because of that, these people, the people in Canaan, are going to become a snare or a trap for you to fall into. And really, that was a common imagery. It was the imagery of a, of a bird trap in the ancient Near East where a bird would fly into a, a, a trap and it would cause a spring to knock the bird down or a spring that would pierce the bird and kill it. And so what God is saying is this trap of the people of Canaan around you is going to lead to your death because what they're, how they're going to trap you is you're going to pursue the gods of Canaan rather than me, and it's going to cause you to die. Because only the eternal God, only the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is eternal and offers life. The gods of Canaan didn't offer anything. The gods of Mount Pleasant, Charleston, and we can, we can list those idols, idols of success, of money, of personal advancement, idols of pluralism, moral relativism. Those idols don't lead to anything. Only the triune God offers life. And the people of Israel, the people of Judah, are not following him. And as we read the text, how, does, how do they respond? It says they began to weep. And that's why the name of the place is Bochum. It means weepers. But as, as we'll see next week and the weeks that follow, it's really just a superficial kind of emotional experience that they have without a lot of lasting depth. In other words, their repentance is pretty shallow. They're getting real worked up over it but it doesn't really have an impact on their life. Ian Murray um, writes about the story of um, the Welsh preacher, the 20th century Welsh preacher, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he was preaching in Wales, was accused by a critic of producing emotionalism in the crowd and in his congregation, getting people real worked up, and they criticized Martin Lloyd-Jones for that. Martin Lloyd-Jones responded and said, it's very easy to make the Welshman cry. But he said it takes an earthquake to make them change their mind. It takes more than just tears. It takes more than just emotionalism to, to get a change of action. And The tears in, in Israel, the tears in Judah here are good, but repentance is much better. A change of direction, that's repentance, is much better. The tribes of Israel, they got their feelings hurt. The angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, he really hurt their feelings, but they didn't change their actions at all. They still pursued the idols of the land. And so this morning, as we kind of 
step back and look at what we've just read in chapter 1 and the first verses of chapter 2, there's a couple lessons for us this morning before we leave. We can appear to have it all together. We can appear on the service level that things are great. I think we're really good at that in Mount Pleasant. Really good at that in Charleston. Things are always great. How are you doing? Great. Things are always good. But there can be a tendency to underneath the surface be disobedient to the Lord and not follow his word, scripture. And what we learned this morning is that there are consequences to that. There are consequences to disobedience. One writer said that the theme of chapter 1 of Judges, the theme is the canonization of Israel. Canonization. Becoming more and more like the people of Canaan rather than becoming more and more like the people of God. Instead of changing their culture and their world for the Lord, they were reflecting the values of Canaan. They were reflecting the values of of a people group that was hostile to the Lord. And so that question is very appropriate for us in 2016. Are we changing our world for the Lord? Are we honoring him? Or are we reflecting the values and the practices of our own culture? Are we reflecting biblical truth more or American culture more? Are we following the gods of Mount Pleasant, like we've mentioned, the gods of success, of money, moral relativism? You decide what's right. The gods of pluralism. Because the idols in Canaan were no different than the idols in Mount Pleasant. Whatever you pursue, if it's not the Lord, will promise fulfillment and success and happiness, but will never give that to you. You always are searching for it. It was the same for the people of Canaan, and it's the same today. Whatever you're pursuing apart from the Lord will only lead to a desire for more, an emptiness, because it can't fulfill that. I think one of the marks of in our culture, of acceptance is how tolerant are you? How tolerant are you? In Scripture, one of the marks of following the Lord is how obedient are you? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And those commands are are pretty clear. They're in Scripture. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. And so that's the first lesson, that obedience to the Lord is more important than the appearance of success. Obedience to the Lord is more important than the appearance of success. The second lesson, and I'll finish with this, is that just like the people of Israel, the tribes of Israel, you and I are all covenant breakers. We have all broken our covenant with the Lord. It's easy to read the stories in the weeks ahead and say, you know, why did they do this? this was, that was such foolishness. Why did they not trust the Lord? But you and I are no different. We, we break the, the Lord's commands every day, probably if we're honest about it, we break God's covenant and deserve punishment. And so the question this morning is, how does a faithful, holy God, how does he uphold his redemptive purposes? How does he accomplish his redemptive purposes and yet still be just and punish sin and sinners? How does he do that? Because he's holy, he's just, he's accomplishing his plan of redemption, but yet the obstacle to that is you and me, really, sinners. How does he do that? God's holy. He was holy then. He's holy now. He was just then with the people. He's just now. So how does he do that? How does he preserve his plan and yet remain holy and just? And the answer, and this is the answer every Sunday, is the cross. It's the cross. That's that's where the tension between God's justice, he is just, and he is gracious, is met. It's at the cross where God punishes sin. He remains just. But it's also at the cross where he offers you forgiveness. He offers grace and says, you can be pardoned. We we sang about that a few moments ago. We can be pardoned. And so at the cross, God demonstrates that he will forgive you for your sin. He will forgive me for my sin. And we can be free from that guilt. We can be healed of the brokenness. We We can know the creator of the world in a personal way as our redeemer. We look to the cross where Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Because it's there where Christ takes our guilt and gives us God's grace. He offers us peace. He offers us freedom, forgiveness, reconciliation with the Holy God, and eternal life. He offers all those things. And and so God's plan of redemption wasn't stopped 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago with these events. And it won't be stopped now despite our sin. 
because at the cross he offers you pardon and he offers you peace. And so this morning what God calls you to do is to receive that if you haven't, to receive that offer of forgiveness. And secondly, once you know the Lord, for each of us, you need to obey him, to follow his word, to follow his commands. And then thirdly, to share that with others, share that good news of what God has done for you in your neighborhood, at your school, in your community, to share the gospel with those that need to hear it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've inspired uh, the writers, including this writer here, to record your acts in history and to remind us that you are faithful even when we are faithless. You are faithful. So we, we thank you for your word, Lord.